a pleasure to come back to Cal here in Berkeley. And in fact, uh, Marvin and Bruno and the former chancellor of your system are all mentors of mine. And so uh, it's always wonderful to see the poor one's parents. <laughs> Um, in fact, I'm going to tell a story of Bob, which I reminded him of earlier today. Oh yes, I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> so, Bob was one of my teachers at MIT when I was in graduate school. And as I, now, you know, memory is a funny thing, and you might not remember things accurately, but as I remember my graduate education, his was the only course I got to be in. <laughs> now, what happened was really more interesting even than that, because you see, somewhere, uh, this was probably my second year of graduate school, and I was trying to figure out how to write a PhD thesis so that I could get the degree and continue to be a physicist. And so I was going around asking professors, are you taking on students, what sort of projects do you have, et cetera. And so somewhere in near the beginning of taking Bob's class, I said, hey, Professor Bergenhoff, do you have any problems that a graduate student might work on? And his response was, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. So one week goes by, two weeks go by, two months go by, <laughs> three months go by, and so he never got back to me. So I was sitting in the uh, final examination with beads of sweat popping out of my forehead, trying to figure out some problem that gets set for us to do, and suddenly I felt this presence looming over me. And so I turned slowly to look up, and there's Bob with a big smile on his face, saying, do you remember asking me about research? <laughs> and I sort of said, yes. And then he said, well, come talk to me. And I said, this guy's crazy. <laughs> and so that's how Bob missed having me as a student. <laughs> that was such a frightening encounter. <laughs> I said, I can't have a PhD advisor that will ask me a question like this on the final when I'm already fighting beyond my wits. But over the years, we have shared many uh, opportunities to meet since then. We've worked on projects together and what have you. And I'm, I have been a very great admirer of uh, your former chancellor. He is, uh, in fact, an incredible individual. And the system here in California was very, very fortunate to have him as a teacher. So, Thank you for your my, what I call, here is the bucket list. <laughs> so the first item on my bucket list is the Higgs boson. And in 2013, on the July the 4th, I'd like to say the Higgs boson was born. Because if you actually look at the date of the announcement from, from CERN, it was actually the 4th of July. So it was literally born on the 4th of July. Um, the next item on my theorist bucket list is gravity waves. Now, Today, there was a, today was one of those glory days in physics, for those of you who don't know and follow such things. There's an experiment uh, whose acronym is BISA, and what they've been doing is studying the cosmic microwave background. We're going to look a little bit at that in this presentation, and what they have found is evidence for what are called B-modes, and we'll talk about that later. But this is like one of the red letter days in physics, so, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we know what we're doing. <laughs> The third item on my list is superpartners, and that's what Marvin mentioned in his introduction. We're going to come in on these things better in the presentation. And in order to ensure that this uh, bucket list, in order to ensure that uh, this bucket list will never be realized, <laughs> the last item is evidence for super string theory, because I will be lucky, uh, I will judge myself lucky if evidence for super string theory from nature presents itself within my lifetime. And that's not a criticism, because I think it's also the only way that our species is going to get to a consistent quantum gravity theory, but we are just so far removed from there that I just don't see it. Uh, and I haven't, I've thought this way for decades. Okay, so the cosmic microwave background. You know, if you uh, go home and throw your food into a, a microwave, it gets warm. And sometimes you have a light bulb in there, that light bulb might burn out. And if you still throw your food in the microwave background, in the oven, it'll still get warm, because there's an invisible form of light, like microwaves, that are doing the heating. So if you could see in microwave and looked up at the night sky, you would actually see a, a pattern of spots, will be, which will be coming visible shortly here. And those patterns or spots are places where the night sky is warmer or cooler in the microwave frequency of the electromagnetic background, of uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Now you would have to have very sensitive eyes, so here we see kind of the, mic the microwave background, illustrated in a cartoon form, of course. 
But if you can detect temperatures that are on the order of one in one part in 10,000, you will see there will be bright spots and dark spots in the night sky, and they would be up there every night that you could go and look. In fact, during the day, you had eyes relaxing in the microwave, it's always up there. Now, I like to call the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB, I like to call it the fact that our universe took a picture, its baby picture, when it was 380,000 years old. Think of that, a universe that's smart enough to take its own picture and have it painted up in the night sky. It's up there for anybody who understands how to go look at it. So today, uh, we heard an announcement from Vice They've been studying the structure. And what, oops, I'm sorry. Jeez, what happened there? Oh, one of my slides disappeared on me. But let me tell the story anyway. So if you study the microwave background, you can look for patterns that essentially look like worlds, and the, uh, uh, for, or vortices, I guess is the perfect word. If you look for these vortices, they've actually been found for the first time in the cosmic microwave background. And this is the strongest evidence to date that in what we call inflationary cosmology works, that our universe began with the Big Bang, that it went, underwent a period of exponential growth, and that this growth exited in a very interesting way. And the signals are up there in the sky for anyone to read who has the technology and the smarts to figure out the story that our universe is trying to tell us. So we're going to leave that realm of cosmology. But like I said, today is one of those red letter days. Every one of you should be sort of jumping for joy because this is a great day for physics. So we're going to go back to the kind of physics I mostly worry about. Uh, and actually, we're going to start with chemistry. You know, if you walk into a chemistry classroom, there's this thing on the wall that you've probably seen a million times and don't think very much about. It's got the letter H on one side, H on the other side, and then a whole pattern. But if you went back far enough in time, that object, that schema, that chart, would look like this. You see, when Mendeleev first proposed the periodic table, there were elements that were not known. And you can see there are holes in this, in this uh, uh, chart behind us. And one of the interesting things about this is that you can use these holes to predict new forms, new elements, new forms of matter. And that's precisely what happened. When Mendeleev created this table, he predicted that these holes would be filled in. He even predicted roughly what would be the chemical properties for the things that were in the missing holes. Of course, the table of elements today looks like this. And as you can see, it's a beautifully symmetrical pattern. Marvin, in his introduction, talked about symmetry. We humans, seem to be exquisitely tuned to symmetry. And I suspect that there's an evolutionary reason for that, which you can pretty, kind of pretty much figure out. You know, you can imagine a tribe of pearl humans on an ancient plane and looking at the horizon, and it's perfectly straight unless you see a bump. And if that bump is moving and getting larger, the question is, is it coming to eat me? Right? And so there's a reason why we would be attuned to symmetry, because it would be a survival of a part of a survival mechanism. Other things about symmetry are interesting. Our concepts of beauty are tied with symmetry, apparently. And so uh, we are exquisitely tuned. So when we see asymmetries, it starts to make us a little bit nervous. We're going to take a journey down to size, because the realm in which I work, in which Bruno started us out, is a world of the very small. So let me tell you a story. Take a yardstick, break the tentacle pieces, throw away 19.1. You go from something this big to about something that big. Take that remaining object, break the tentacle pieces, throw away 19.1 get something about as wide as your fingernail. <coughs> Question, because after all, I'm a college professor, and this is your pop quiz for the evening. Question, how many times do I have to do that to get to the size of the atom? Now, scientists and physicists, of course, know the answer to this question, but if you ask this question in the, among the general population, it's a remarkable diversity, a diversity of answers that you get. Some people say a million times, a billion times, and people say there's no number large enough to get there. The right answer turns out to be 10. Carry this process out 10 times, that takes you from our world to the size of the atom. The first person to know this is actually Albert Einstein. He did it in this famous 1905 paper on grounding motion. That paper actually requires that you uh, calculate the size of the atom. So he's the first person to know how big an atom is. Could have been known before then, but he was the first person to actually use mathematics. So each one of these marks you see here is a power 10. So we're going to go on a journey. Uh, each hash mark being a power of 10. We're going to speed up past a lot of interesting stuff. We're going to slow down 10 to minus 5. That's the size of human blood cells. These are animations of human blood cells. Nuclei still intact, emerging from bone marrow. We're going to continue down in size. At 10 to the minus 9, we encounter a very interesting 
infrastructure, the human strands of DNA, the, the thing that the human genome project was all about, reading the information about how to construct people, and also giving rise to a new field where we can track where humans populated the entire Earth. At 10 to the minus 10, we enter the realm of the atom. That's the story that I told you. Process 10 times, you get to the atom. But we're gonna, uh, not going to stop here. Let's keep going down in size. If we go down to 10 to the minus 15, we encounter the nucleus. And here we see a cartoon of two blue protons, two pink pro, uh, uh, neutrons. And inside of them, we see smaller objects. This is the cartoon representation of the quarks. So that's our little standard model review. Many places, this is a physics chart, but that's, you know, all that information is a chart like this. So if you go to the physics departments, most of the universities will find this chart. There's some people in the audience that actually have something to do with this. Antimatter. That stuff that drives the great starship enterprise, that's real stuff. It wasn't invented by a science fiction writer, it was invented by Paul Dirac, who wrote the equation when he was trying to make the description of an electron consistent with Einstein's relativity and the laws of quantum mechanics and wound up with an equation that had two solutions. One solution described the electron, the other solution described something no one had ever thought about before, a particle that is just like the electron with the same mass but the opposite charge. And more importantly, when you put these two objects together, they go up with a poof of energy, and the amount of energy is exactly what you would predict by using Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. So the quarks are sitting inside of protons and neutrons. We see cartoon illustrations of those here. They also like to get uh, together in pairs a uh, uh, particle and antiparticle. We call those mesons. So particles like the neutron, proton are basically bags with quarks inside of them. A very simple picture that we can communicate even to students in high school. So that's what our elementary particles look like. We have the quarks sitting up here in purple, up, down, charm, strange, top, and then bottom. Then we have the electron and its strands. The electron, by the way, is the original elementary particle. The electron was first posited by an electrochemist named J.G. Stoney in the 1860s, who was trying to figure out how the electroplating worked. And he had this idea that if something smaller than the atom existed in nature, then he could understand what was going on when he lowered the anodes and diodes and put it in the solution and starts to electroplate. He's the first person in recorded history to have the idea that there's something in nature that is smaller than an atom. So you can see this is actually an epical event, something smaller than an atom. So the electron is that thing. But it turns out that nature is prolific. In addition to the electron, nature supplies us with another object that's 200 times as heavy, we call the new particle, as well as another object that is like an electron but 1,700 times heavy. We call it the top particle. And then in addition, nature supplies us with each one of these with a neutral particle, which has a very, very small mass, so small that about a decade ago, or maybe 15 or 20 years ago, you would have asked one of us, we said it has no mass at all, but due to an experiment in Japan called Kamel Kande, we know that these things actually have very, very tiny masses, and that they actually mix with each other. And then finally, there are the force carriers. Marvin mentioned photons. Photons are the force carriers for the electromagnetic force, we need that. There are other forces in nature, the forces that keep those quarks inside the interior of the proton and neutron. There are eight force carriers called gluons for that purpose. The W and Z particles are the particles of the weak force. And most people in the public don't know about the weak force, so let me try to remind you a little bit. If you go back, I was born in the 1950s, there used to be a lot of science fiction movies. Whenever the mutant monster came out, it glowed. That glow is actually real. It's caused by the weak interaction, and so there are force carriers for the weak interaction. All these particles act like little spinning tops. But there's something very strange about them. Quarks and, lepton, quarks, and, uh, quarks and leptons spin at a rate which we physicists measure in the number called h bar. In fact, their spin rate goes like uh, integer or half integer, half integer in the case of the electron, times half integer plus one times h bar squared. So you can think about measuring the spin rate. But the spin rate, it, you can either speed it up or slow it down. It's fixed by nature, unlike a basketball. So, how do the forces work? Well, it's what Marvin told us. Namely, in this cartoon here, we see two particles of light illustrated by these little white blobs, and we can think of those as electrons. One electron tells the other, you must be repelled. It does so by sending a message carrier saying, I'm here, I have a negative charge, if you have a negative charge, move away from my location. That message carrier is, in fact, the photon, which you can see in the middle of this picture. Now, what's really wonderful about this picture is it allows me to tell the story to anyone, who even if you have very little scientific training, you can understand the story. And yet, 
this is also a technical device Richard, invented by Richard Feynman for calculating the, mag the mathematical expression for the forces between two electrons. But Feynman also told us life is actually much more complicated for electrons. Here's another picture that explains the repulsion between two electrons. What's different about this one? Well, on the left-hand side here, you can see the electron emits a particle of light, which it may have then later reabsorbs. That was not there in the picture before. If you calculate the mathematical expression for this, it's different from what you learned in high school with one of our school. And then this isn't just the beginning of a more complicated story. That diagram we just saw is called vacuum, it's called vertex corrections. Here we see a process called vacuum polarization. In this process, you have an electron that emits a photon at the point I'm pointing here. This photon moves along and then disappears into a particle antiparticle pair, which then travels a small distance. They have opposite charge, they attract each other, they get back together, e equals mc squared says they pre produce a photon. It is this second photon that then communicates in the way from me. And when you put this together mathematically, you find out it is yet different again from one over r squared. So I'd like to tell people we physicists are really good at lying. <laughs> you see, because when we start to tell you, certainly in high school, about the force between two particles, we say, gee, it goes like one over the square of the distance times the product of the charges. That's just the first picture I showed you. That picture turns out to be correct if there is no quantum mechanics in the universe. But we apparently do live in a quantum mechanical universe. And so the force law is actually different from the thing that we teach you in high school. It has small corrections proportioned to higher and higher powers of each one. Uh, the charges uh, for quarks and leptons are rather strange. They obey these equations, and these equations actually ensure the mathematical consistency of the objects I'm talking about. And so here's our standard model. This was a standard model as of two years ago. We see our quarks, our leptons, our force carriers, the blue ones over the far right, and then when the the discovery of the Higgs boson happened, that's what happened. We added one more. That should ring a little bell. Remember when we went back and looked at chemistry? It started with Mendeleev's table with holes, and then we had to fill them in to find all the elements that we now know about? This is an illustration of a point which the general public doesn't often seem to have access to, which is that science is a dynamic process. Science isn't some big static thing that sits in a book. In fact, I like to tell people that if you think the things in the science books is science, that's just like walking into a, a sculpture studio, looking down at the floor, seeing a whole bunch of pebbles, and concluding that the job of sculptors is to make little pebbles. You have missed the entire point of the activity. That's how science works. Science is the facts we uncover they're kind of the dendrites. They're what's left over. But it's the uncovering of those facts. That's where the science lies. So that's how we do science, the dynamical uncovering of the mysteries of nature. And so we added the H part of it. So if I go back, <coughs> look at that table for a second. Is that symmetrical or not? Well, you know, you might say, well, it's kind of symmetrical. So let me look at this through a slightly different lens. Let me tell you a little story. Imagine that there were two children uh, sitting on a swing, and the two children are going back and forth. And one, uh, at first I'm going to, I think you will watch several children. So the first child is going to be a boson and fermion. And I put them on a swing, and I start them swinging, and then, you know, they might get in phase, or they might rock together, because that's, after all, how little children act, right? You can swing in phase, or you can swing out of phase. So now let me take one child named uh, Fermion and the other child named Boson. Once again, I watch them swing. They can swing in phase or they can swing out of phase. That's perfectly acceptable. Now let me take two children whose names are Fermions. What you find is the most amazing thing. If you put them in the swing, they can only swing 180 degrees. No, uh, I'm sorry, they can only swing out of phase. So that when one child is going forward, the other child goes back. The other first, second child comes forward, the uh, first child goes back. And that's the only way they can swing. That's, uh, that story captures the essence of the exclusion principle that Marvin told you a moment ago, that it is excluded for the two fermions to swing together. They can only swing in this rocking and symmetrical motion. And this story that I told you can actually be calculated into a simple quantum mechanics class. 
If you take, for example, two particles, combine them, uh, confine them to what we business call an infant square well, and look at the wave functions and say that these things are fermions, you will find out that only anti-symmetric pairs of products of wave functions can actually work. And so that's the swinging that we talked about. So bosons and fermions, that's a fundamental property of nature. So let me look at the standard model in a slightly different way. Ah, let me point one other thing out. I talked about spinning tops. The Higgs boson has no spin at all. It is the first fundamental particle we have ever discovered in several hundred years of doing science that has no spin. So it's a very different animal from all the rest of the objects in the zoo. So, when we talk about bosons and fermions, let's look at all the particles in the standard model through this lens of bosons and fermions versus what they do. Again, following Marvin's discussion. What we find is that the electron and all of its friends are matter particles, just as was said in the introduction. The quarks are also matter particles. They are not uh, force carriers. <laughs> On the other hand, all the bosons in the model, the gluon, the photon, the Z and W intermediate vector bosons, and the Higgs particle, those are our bosons. In other words, if we go back to our swinging analogy, everything that's a boson is allowed to either swing either in phase or out of phase. Everything that's a fermion has to have this anti-rocking phase, and that's the only thing they can do. That's a simple way to remember what's a boson, what's a fermion. So I let me look at this picture. Is this symmetrical? It's obviously not. And so when I was a graduate student studying the equations that our colleague here first posited could apply to nature, I almost immediately got the fact that those equations said that this picture, which is what we understood of nature, although the Higgs boson wasn't there in those days, that this picture could be augmented and made symmetrical. And if you do it, it looks like this. As you can see, this is a far more symmetrical image. So the way that it works is, here's the particles of the standard model that we had before. Let's go backwards. So here they are. These are the force carriers. These are the matter particles. In a supersymmetrical universe, you have to first add four additional Higgs particles, at a minimum. There may be even more, but at a minimum, you need four additional Higgs particles. And then these are all bosons. In order to get the balance I'm talking about, it's a balance across the horizontal axes in this image. You have to add mirror images of these objects that are fermions. So for the gluons, you have to add gluinos. For the photon, you have to add photinos. For the Higgs particle, which is sitting over here, you have to add the Higgsinon. Now, my favorite particle is actually this one right here that I'm pointing to. It is the superpartner to the W particle, and its name is spelled W-I-N-O. <laughs> So if you ever see a headline from an international paper of the New York Times saying, W-I-N-O, Finland in Geneva, <laughs> they will not be talking about an alcoholic specialist. Instead, they will be talking about this super partner if we're ever so fortunate. It's a kind of particle. Now, what's really interesting about this picture is that you can see again that our notion, our intrinsic notion of symmetry is really very apparent once you look along the axis of energy versus matter, or by energy I mean force carriers, and then crossways between boson and fermion. If you say that, gee, nature somehow likes symmetry, but here's a symmetry that we've never seen in the laboratory, in this account, and this goes back to the Marvin's point, is that we haven't actually seen all this. But here's a symmetry that mathematically we know can be allowed by the equations that describe our physics, and yet we've never seen it in the laboratory. And again, paying tribute to the introduction, we know, however, from about uh, 50 years of experience that sometimes symmetries hide from us. We call them broken symmetries. And in fact, the discovery of the Higgs boson is precisely along this line. The Higgs boson, we couldn't see it because we couldn't see the full symmetry of the electroweak interaction. When you know the symmetry is there, you then actually say, gee, there's this thing that I haven't seen in the laboratory. But the symmetry says it ought to be there. That's how the hunt for the Higgs boson got started. It was started by a mathematical argument that Peter Higgs and then the other individuals that have been recognized, uh, starting with Anderson, Brau, Anglaire, let's see, Higgs, uh, Higgs, Kibble, Hagen, 
Cooked, and I think that's, I got everybody, and Kipple, that's it. Those folks all together created this mathematics that said, go look for that thing. And we spent several decades looking for that thing. It finally showed up on July the 4th, 2013. It was driven by symmetry. It's also driven by mathematical consistency, because it turns out that this is also the solution to a problem. The problem is, how do you have force carriers that have mass? Those things in the middle that would do little wiggly lines, the photon has no mass. But we know that the W and Z particle have to have mass from experiments. So the question is, how do you have right mathematics that's consistent with that? The Higgs mechanism is the solution. Well, we live in a very interesting universe, it turns out. And people like me go down in size, but people like your department chairman here look in other directions. They look kind of up. Because, you know, there's half the universe up there. You know, you spend your time looking down at the ground, you miss everything that's up here. And so there's half the universe up there. And it turns out that universe also is the same universe as looking down. And so therefore, you might not be surprised to understand that there are connections between these two things. Now, I have to tell you, when I was in graduate school, this was not completely clear. I mean, we kind of partitioned ourselves into those that looked at small physics, things like atoms and elementary particles and what have you. And then the other partitioning were those that did cosmology and astronomy, looking at big physics. And we never really thought about the connections very much, except that in the 1930s, some really weird and interesting things started to happen. So for example, you can ask yourself, gee, we have a universe where there's hydrogen and helium. We do. We have lots of elements, but we have those two. And then you can say, how much hydrogen is there in our universe? And you can make some estimates by observation. How much helium is there in our universe? Again, you will observe it. And then you can ask an even more profound question. Why are those two numbers the way they are? It turns out in the 1930s, through a process called uh, primordial nuclear synthesis, we began to answer that question. And you see, primordial nuclear synthesis has a lot to do with the way stars work, and therefore you've got to look up to kind of know about that stuff. But helium and hydrogen atoms are tiny. So you can start to see the knitting together of the size of the large and the size of the small. And this has actually started there, but it really gained enormous momentum in the last two decades. In fact, we look in both directions now and trying to understand the way that our universe put together. So in our universe, by looking up, we know some really strange things about our universe. First of all, you know, we humans have created this wonderful thing called physics, and yes, we think life would be sad and tragic if it didn't exist. And yet, from our 700 years worth of exploring this realm, we have studied, roughly speaking, about 4% uh, of, of what seems to be in the universe. 700 years of experience. Again, back in the 1930s, uh, Fritz Zwicky started telling us that can't be all to the story. And the way that he did it was, you know, the galaxy looks like a giant pinwheel. And if you know that the galaxies is held together by gravity, you can use rates of rotation to figure out how much gravity there is to hold it together. And when you look at as Zwicky looked at uh, our galaxies, he figured out that the stars out on the edge of the uh, Milky Way are rotating as if there is far more mass towards the center than we could measure by counting stars. Vera Rubin in the 70s came to the same conclusion, not by looking at our galaxy, but by looking at other galaxies. They have these things called rotation curves, and you look at them, and they all have this very strange character. If the amount of gravity was only what you could see, then the things on the outside are going too fast. And so the solution that we start to think about is, is what used to be called dark stars. We now call this dark matter. And this dark matter, this stuff that accounts for the structure of the galaxy is incredible stuff because not only does it account for the structure of the galaxy, it does so in terms of even the lifetime. Without dark matter, our galaxy's pinnacles would have fallen apart before now. But dark matter either plays a more fundamental role. If you put in our modern description of the uh, evolution of the, of the universe, what you find out is dark matter creates the wells into which ordinary matter falls and begins to create stars. And so dark matter is incredibly important stuff, and yet we don't know what it is. That's kind of embarrassing. But even more mysterious, and I don't 
see Saul, but I saw him earlier today. Uh, there he is. Saul came along with a few of his colleagues a few years ago and really blew our minds, those of us who were physicists, because he said, look, you guys, we live in a universe where the expansion is not slowing down, it's speeding up. And so you, if you live in a universe where the acceleration, the expansion is speeding up, the question is why? And so we don't really know the answer, but we physicists are like doctors. I don't know how many of you know what an idiopathic condition is. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, so you know. So let me share with the rest of you. My wife is a medical doctor, and I must admit, I learned all kinds of things from her. So if you go to a doctor looking for the answer to some ailment that you have, and the doctor tells you it's an idiopathic condition, you actually should not get frightened. Because that's the fancy way of saying, I don't know what you have. <laughs> there, it's called idiopathic syndrome. I have no idea what it means. Well, we physicists are kind of like that too. And so when Saul and his colleagues, Adam and Lisa and the other folks, gave us this story about the speeding of the universe, we had to find an explanation. It turns out Albert Einstein kind of provided one many, many years ago, this thing that we call the cosmological constant. But what's really interesting is that the cosmological constant that we need to explain the result that Saul found is actually has the opposite sign from the one that Einstein wanted in order to hold the universe as a fixed and static wall. And so, uh, once again, we see the dynamical process of physics at work and science at work. So this is stuff called dark matter. Okay, so if this stuff is really there, we need to explain all these things about the universe, how come we haven't seen it? Well, now I'm going to try to tie this to the absence of seeing superpartners. Because remember, in order to get the symmetry, I think there had to be a lot more stuff. We've never seen it in the laboratory. So maybe these two things are symptomatic of the same thing. Maybe the fact that we haven't seen dark matter that explains on the cosmological scale what's going on is also the absence of seeing the superpartners. And in fact, in a large class of equations that study superpartners, you find out that there are candidates in the equations, things that are called weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs are their nicknames. You can see in the WIMPs objects that could play the role of the dark matter on the cosmological scale. Now, WIMPs are kind of interesting because they're kind of like the, the extra part of the super, of the standard, of the uh, super symmetric extension, but they would correspond to the lightest one of those extra things you've ever seen, the LSP, lightest super symmetrical particle. Now, the story in science is never completely clear. Maybe it's WIMPs. It turns out that there are way, there are even with super partners ways to avoid having WIMPs that do the job. But if you include a property called R parity, they do the job. So in a large class of models, WIMPs look like the source of dark matter that you need on the cosmological scale. This is what I was looking for earlier. We talked about the uh, B-mode discovery. You see the rings in this diagram? Roughly speaking, the B-modes acting on the uh, cosmological, uh, uh, I'm sorry, their signatures in the CMB tell us that there are these ring-like structures among the primordial gravitational fields. And that's what we're celebrating when we say today is a red letter day for physics. And I'm sorry, this transparency was out of place. <coughs> now, Higgs particle. Okay, we've seen it. Is that the end of the story? Well, almost. Um, Higgs particle has a mass of about 125 or 126 GeV over C squared. GeV over C squared is how people like me measure mass. We don't say five pounds. You know, that would be too simple. That would be too accessible to the public, right? <laughs> so we have to make it somehow fancy. GeV over C squared. So the Higgs particle weighs about 125, 126 GeV over C squared. And there's something very funny about that number, because again, if you study the mathematics of how the Higgs particle has to exist in the presence of quantum gravity, what you realize is that number is very, very peculiar. And peculiar in what sense? Well, let me again tell the story. Imagine I had a quarter and I started flipping it. What would the outcomes be when it lands on the ground? I suspect you would say heads or tails. But there's another possibility, namely the one that's shown in the middle of this diagram. In principle, at least, when you flip a quarter, it could land and sit on its edge. In principle. Now, if you did that once, you'd say, oh, you know, some weird fluke. But if you did that 
several hundred times and always got the quarter to land on his head, you would suspect there's something going on that you hadn't taken into account. Well, you see, in the Higgs boson case, when we look at this mass of 125 or 126 GeV over C squared, that mass is light compared to what the equations will permit. And in fact, the thing that's really funny about that number, remember we talked about quantum processes? If you look at the quantum processes that involve the Higgs boson, what you find is that there's a process we like to call quadratic divergences, which basically says that the mass can fluctuate as you try to get more and more accurate answers. And so this is a condition we call naturalness, that those fluctuations should not occur. And so when you get this light Higgs boson with this mass that seems to be held in a small number, you have to ask, is there something else going on? This has been illustrated by a, a physicist named Matt Strassler in these diagrams. And this is a little bit of the only graphs I'm going to show you. What he points out is that if you have two arbitrary curves, so the red curve and the black hole, just pick any old curve you want. I don't really care what your curve is. Just pick two of them. If you add them together, two arbitrary curves, then what you find is that when you add them together, there's no reason to expect a region of flatness at this point. Because the two curves are, the curves are arbitrary, so they should fluctuate in an arbitrary manner. On the other hand, this condition that naturalness occur in the standard model is analogous to saying we're going to add two curves, and instead we find this nice flat region, which is the stability against perturbations that should occur. Now, this is not an ironclad argument, but it's an argument that the majority of the particle physics community has, in fact, been thinking about for 20 or 30 years, and so naturalness turns out to be what we think is an important uh, restriction on models of nature. And so you have to ask where does naturalness come from? Anytime the universe is supersymmetric, naturalness is built in. Because it turns out that that, uh, that, that different behavior I told you about, that fermions have to do this, whereas bosons can do anything, that behavior when you translate it in terms of Feynman graphs turns out to be minus signs. And those fluctuations that we talk about, you get a bunch of positive fluctuations, you get an equal number of negative fluctuations, and they're exactly what you need in order to get the soup to be just right. So this is the world of supersymmetry, the world that people like me have been studying. Bruno is sort of one of the fathers of the idea. Do we know that it's in nature? No, we don't know that yet. As you can see, our partners double. Here's a list of the force carriers. Here's the quarks and the squarks. And here's the leptons and the leptons. This is what the mathematics sort of looks like, folks. If you want to study this stuff, this is the kind of thing that I began to learn on the Bruno's toolage when I was a graduate student reading his papers. They weren't quite written in this language, but this is what the equation said. They said if you take an electron, oops, if you take an electron, which is this object in the middle here, this is kind of half an electron. Supersymmetry says that that balance I showed you in the pictures translates to this in terms of equations. I have to add in the other half electron to get the whole electron. And that predicts that in nature, if you have an electron, there are four squarks associated with the electron, not two, because this is only half an electron. If you start with the photon, which is this object A, then its superpartner is the object lambda, and the equations here tell us something about the relationship between the two. And then finally, I'll talk about one final object. In nature, well, there's this theory called string theory that you may have rumors about. Well, in string theory, there are a set of objects that are called the uh, axion and the biloton, and they are, in fact, supersymmetric, and they're sort of, arbit they're sort of avatars that tell you that gravity has to be included into the mathematical construct. So this is where my PhD thesis sort of began some 30 years ago, by studying equations like this. Now I'm gonna skip ahead because I've been a little bit slow here and I'm worried about the time. Uh, so let me jump ahead just a little bit in my presentation and point out that there are problems in my field that for 30 years no one has been able to solve. So about 10 years ago, when I was in my 50s, I said, well, I'm old enough that I don't care that people start laughing at me about the problems I think to solve, especially if the, there's a consensus that the problems can't be solved. I figured I am a tenured professor. I have the luxury. I don't have to worry about tenure anymore. I have the luxury to go out and look at these ideas that people say can't be done. And so with a friend, a colleague of mine named Michael Fox, the first thing we did 
is we developed a graphical language for understanding superpartners. This balance that I showed you. Now, this graphical language is illustrated in the diagram that I showed you here. The picture that you see on the left-hand side of this equation is completely equivalent to all the equations that you see on the right side of the image. They are in one-to-one -one correspondence. In fact, things like Feynman rules exist to convert these pictures into the equations. And that was our discovery, that there's this graphical language for understanding supersymmetry. Furthermore, it turns out that calculus becomes incredibly simple in this graphical language. And now I just did a, different, a derivative. Imagine when in calculus class, I can just move beads around. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, I just did a derivative, and you saw those balls move. It turns out every white ball this is actually a function of every black, every white ball is a boson, every black ball is a fermion. And in fact, if you check these relationships, which I can show you offline sometime, I've just actually converted between two supersymmetrical sets of equations. So we were surprised that these graphs uh, could capture all of this information. So here's the second graph. And you know, in my business, when you find something interesting, you know, it's, it's very difficult to be theoretical physicists, folks. Because most of the time, you spend your life in frustration. And there's something you want to solve, you can't solve. You don't know the answer. And you're struggling to find the answer. So when you find an answer, often in my field, we decide to name something in a very arbitrary, capricious, and often comical way. So we decided to give these pictures a name. We started calling them the dingoes. The word is actually a West African word. It basically translates as a symbol with hidden meaning. And that's what these symbols are. So we, Michael actually was a super person who suggested it, and I immediately said, that's a great idea. So we've been studying these mathematical objects. And the thing that's really interesting about these mathematical objects is they allowed me to make a breakthrough to speak to people like my friend Edward. You see, I had been studying these equations for about five years, and I had found all this interesting structure. And in the summer of 2005, there was a math conference in Marseille, France, where I was a speaker. I was speaking in front of an audience of almost exclusively mathematicians. I was trying to find some mathematician to explain to me what the structure was that we had found. I gave this talk. And at the end of the talk, it was completely clear that no one in the audience understood anything I had spent an hour talking about. <laughs> so I said, you know, mathematicians are really smart people, because they are. So how can I find a way to be an effective speaker? And it turns out that these pictures actually were the breakthrough. Because you see, physicists like me, we like, when we write equations, They tend to look like that. But, you know, they're, they're kind of scattershot. They have all these weird symbols. These things, these labels, uh, these labels like this one and that one are things we call subscripts. Mathematicians hate subscripts. Mostly. And so I had made the mistake of using my physicist language to try to communicate some ideas to a group of mathematicians. And the utter failure of that attempt, which is the worst presentation I've ever made at a conference. The utter failure of that told me I needed to find another language to express the ideas. And that's why we were primed to find another way to express these relationships that we could see in the equations. Now when we found this language, it was actually these pictures. And what's really interesting is the way that it actually worked is the pictures act as a Rosetta Stone. That is, we physicists knew about the equations that generate a certain picture. We could kind of hold the picture up in front of our mathematical colleagues' eyes and say, what do you see here? Now, you may think it's funny. And most people think that mathematicians or physicists, at least theoretical physicists, do something rather similar. Well, if you're a mathematician or a theoretical physicist, you know that's not true. In fact, there's a language barrier. And so these graphs are how we got past the language barrier. Because we could show our mathematical colleagues these objects and say, what do you see here? And they start telling us things like, gee, that's a combinatorial object that you've, just, you've discovered that's buried in the equations of your physics. Now this led to an astounding discovery. Uh, as I said, I've been time to kind of speed up a little bit here. But this led to an astounding discovery uh, several years ago. Namely, here's a more complicated set of equations. And now I'm going to do some algebra. Algebra here means move the balls around. So gee, it wouldn't it be great to get this into the K through 12 system? Right? Maybe we can get more kids to actually think about mathematics as fun. 
Uh, I'm going to do, after doing some matrix algebra, because that's what I'm actually doing here, I'm changing the location of these balls and what corresponds to acting with matrices. There, I'm doing an interval. Knowing the ball means that you did an interval. I'm doing uh, four intervals right now. I'm going to do three more. And when I finish the next three intervals, what you're going to see that there's a, there are two identical subsidels that were not at all apparent in the initial picture, and therefore that pattern wasn't apparent in the equations either. Now I'm going to take these two subsidels and smash them together. Black balls to black balls, white balls to white balls, blue lines to solid blue, dash green to dash green, solid reds to solid reds, complete matching. And as you can see, I have to go through some manipulations to do that. They are now lined up with the smash. I open it back up. And remember, this is mathematics. So that means I can extract equations from this. Both the initial picture I showed, those are seven equations. This thing that I'm showing you is a set of equations. This thing corresponds to equations that describe half the electron. The object I showed you initially contains equations that actually, can, uh, that actually are parts of Maxwell's equations. And so what we just learned by this graphical story is that Maxwell's equations are somehow, in some deep mathematical way, related to the equation of Dirac, which describes the electron. Now that's really interesting, because if you wanted to have a unified yield theory, which is what Einstein wanted, you would need to have a mathematical structure that joins the equations of Maxwell's equation to the equations of Dirac. That's what we have found in this language, a graphical way to illustrate those connections. Now, it turns out that I'm going, I'm going to end my talk by telling you the thing that has gotten me into lots and lots of trouble. So this is that picture that I showed you of this more complicated thing that contains Maxwell's equations. Let me get rid of the dashing so that it looks like this. And also let me introduce a kind of notation. That is, I'm going to get each ball a name. I'll call the bottom ball 0, 0, 0, 0. And the reason for doing this is because there are four colors in this picture. If I move along a red link, I will change the first 0 to a 1. If I move along a green link, I will change the second 0 to a 1. If I move along the third link, I will change the third 0 to a 1. And if I move along the black link, I'll change the last 0 to a 1. If you actually start moving through this graph, you can find out this is a unique name to get addresses to everybody in the graph. And you can see their names that I've actually shown to you. Now when I folded that picture up, what happens is that this ball here actually got folded down there. The ball that is uh, sitting here actually folds together with the ball sitting there. The ball that's sitting on this side of the image folds over there. So what you can see from this point of view is once you name these balls, what happens is when you fold them together, they all have to, when you add their addresses, you have to have the same address. One, 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 one. Now, when we derive this result, uh, and I have to acknowledge my colleagues here, there are three mathematicians, three physicists, myself, uh, Tristan Huch, and Michael Fox were the physicists, uh, Charles Duran, uh, Kevin Ega, and uh, Greg Landwerper were the mathematicians. And when we derived this result, we wrote a paper, and we wondered about this patterns of ones. And it turns out that if you know something about digital communication, one, 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 one should ring a bell. When you sit at your browser creating good strings of bits and sending them to another computer, they're static on the line. So something you type as a one might be received as a zero on the other side. Something you type as a zero might be received as a one on the other side. And so if you're going to have reliable digital communication, you have to wait, have a way to figure out when the static has flipped bits. This is something that Richard Hamming figured out in the 1940s. There are these things called error correcting codes. And their precise role is to undo the flip bits that were done by the fluctuations of the system. It turns out that this number 1111 is the simplest member of a block of a set of codes that are called block me yourself dual error correcting codes. The set of numbers 411, the four ones. And so what we come is a very strange thing. We found both from equations in physics to error correcting codes of a very specific nature. The kind of error correcting codes that work to keep your browsers reliably communicating to each other. So we wrote a paper. And this was like five years ago. And we submitted the paper to a journal, and it was rejected. Because we couldn't get anybody to understand. First of all, we couldn't understand what was going on. It took six months before we started talking about paper, even after we wrote it. And then when we submitted it, no referee could sort of get wrapped their mind about it. We kept getting rejections. And so we kept working at trying to explain the narrative better. 
But in the meantime, uh, just like I'm speaking to you, I, I took a fair number of uh, public presentations, and sometimes people ask me about my research. And so if you actually go to YouTube right now, you'll find that there's a video that has me in it making the claim that we live in the world of the matrix. <laughs> now, how does that actually work? Well, let's see. I wrote an article for Physics World, the English Journal, a couple of years ago about this research. And at the end of the article, as a joke, I said, imagine the Matrix movie had physicists in it. How could they figure out they lived in the Matrix? One way might be to look for signs of, of computer code in the laws of their physics. But that's what we were pointing to in the equations of supersymmetry. Now, in the article, we also say, look, we know that just because you find the same mathematics in two different systems doesn't mean the two systems are related to each other. This was a warning that you could find in Bigner's famous essay on the unreasonable effectiveness. So we know that. We, we stated it. But you know, the public is a very different kind of, has a different, different set of kind of uh, standards. And so there's this kid who said, Jim Gates claims we live in the matrix. How do you say that? <laughs> so if you have friends who say there's a scientist who says we live in the matrix, please correct them. <laughs> Error correction. <laughs> what I said was that the structure of supersymmetrical equations involves error correcting flows at a very deep level. And there are four things that you could think about in response to this. You could say it's just an accident, the different mass, uh, same math, different systems. Or you could go the route of this kid who created this YouTube video, which has almost half a, minute, half a million hits on it now. And you can say, oh yeah, we're the Sims in somebody's computer. <laughs> uh, about a month after we wrote the article in Physics World, another young man who I've never met came up with a different solution. He said, hmm, error correcting codes of nature? This is a person of deep faith. We're Sims in God's species. <laughs> and then, and now come to why my title is so strange, because you see, when we finally, when I started thinking about this result of error correcting codes in physics, the first question I asked myself was, is there any place in a natural system where we have seen the action of error correcting codes? And I keep bumping into people in genetics who say, yes, in genetics, there is some evidence that error correcting codes work on the genome to support its stability. So as a scientist, if you ask me to answer a question, the first thing I'm gonna do is try to go look for a model in nature. And so if you ask me what these error correcting codes are doing here, the only model I have to point to is genomics. Now, if error correcting codes are present in genomics, it's pretty easy to figure out what they're doing. They're actually maintaining the stability of the genome because they're basically controlling fluctuations so that you successfully propagate the organism into the future. So why would equations of physics need error correcting codes? And there's only one time in the history of the universe that I know about when this might be true, and that's near the time of the Big Bang. You see, at the time of the Big Bang, if you try to think back to as close as you can to the time of the Big Bang, the universe was a place where incredible high densities and incredible high temperatures, fluctuations, and so the question becomes, how does any stable structure come into existence and maintain itself in that environment? It might be advantageous to have a system that has error correcting codes in it. And so, that's why we have this strange title. Error correcting codes in genomics is that there are evidence of evolution. If error correcting, if supersymmetry is found in nature, the big philosophical challenge will be, what are these error correcting codes doing there? And the only answer I know from a model of nature is a model that comes from biology, genomics, and evolution. Thank you. setting much like this, and I quite frankly was unprepared to give an answer because I hadn't thought about what the codes might do. 
it, I believe, has something to do with the consistency of the laws of nature, essentially. That if we find it, so there, let's make sure we understand. First, we've got to figure out that, that the world is supersymmetric. That means we've got to find evidence of it. We can't just say we know this is the case. As soon as we find evidence of supersymmetry, this mathematics that I've got, I can explain to anybody who's willing to give me enough time, and I can show you the presence of these error correcting codes. The next step of why are they there? Well, there's not a derivation that I can give you. The only thing I can say is, let's see if we can figure out a scenario and by which the universe would need such a structure embedded in its laws. And the only scenario that I can think of, which is the one I related to you, is imagine, you see, the laws of the universe actually have to come into existence with the universe itself. At least that's our modern view, is that they were not preordained. They actually come into existence with the universe. And if that's the case, then you can think of the laws as having had some huge space in which they might have been selected. And then in that huge space, if you have a very early universe, it's got to select the ones that allow, that allow it to be, a, at least from all we've understood, mathematical consistency is a fundamental part of our universe. So among all these laws that are possible, the universe has got to select a set of mathematical laws that are consistent. And I suspect that if, if there's something to this, if they're not accidents, I think this is the strongest argument I can give you about why they're there. Actually, I have a question and a request. Started with a request. Is there any conceivable possibility you could make your full set of slides available for perusal on the internet? I will have to speak to my lawyer. <laughs> no, no, I'm quite serious. Uh, I really will have to speak to my lawyer. Uh, I think they were being filmed because I see a camera. You you certainly have access to those, but yeah, yeah. But I mean, I mean the other ones that you skipped. Yeah. So the problem is, in fact, thank you for reminding me because I've been remiss about something. See, the problem for me is that a lot of these images that I use are in a commercial product. It's called Super String Theory, the DNA of Reality. This is a set of 24 lectures that I was asked to create for the teaching company. And so you're going to find a lot of these images in there, but this is not a commercial. But by the same token, they own the IP to this. And so I cannot willy-nilly just disseminate it. If it's filmed like this, it's a different thing, but I cannot give the original pieces of software because they're embedded things in it. So that's item number one. And then I have to acknowledge uh, graphic artists because I don't have the skills to put these kinds of images together. So I work with graphic artists, which by the way, I think is a thing that we physicists have to learn more and more to do if we're gonna be effective at communicating outside of our own circles. And my question, you said that the, uh, the Higgs uh, has no spin. That's correct. Uh, are you speaking of the theoretical or of the uh, uh, observed? Uh, Both. Particle? Theoretically, the Higgs particle has no spin. However, if you go to the LHC, in fact, let me, let me do that for you since you asked the question. Give me a second here. <coughs> Sometimes people ask me to speak about the Higgs particle, so I have a Higgs particle talk. So we're going to take advantage of that fact. In fact, let me, in fact, let me not do this when we pull up the, the, uh, the PowerPoint. Marvin didn't ask me to speak about the Higgs particle, so I didn't. So if you actually went to the LAC and talked to the people who performed the experiments, they will tell you that the way that we see Higgs particles is by essentially by looking for decays of W particles into particular patterns, typically four lepton type patterns. <coughs> now the intermediate stage of that decays is that the Higgs particle actually decays into a, a W plus and a W minus. These are spinning particles, and so we can actually look at the angular momentum of the products that come out of the reaction and use that to predict the spin of the particle that is the parent, and it gives zero. So that's how we know that the experiment with the Higgs particle doesn't have a spin. A little bit late, so we're going to have one more question, and then we'll thank our speaker. Uh, hi, uh, so uh, as far as I understand, error corrected code just means take a vector space and you put it inside another vector space in a particularly clever way. So from that, I might have thought that the appearance of error-correcting codes in the laws 
just met, you uh, wrote too many laws and with the wrong variables. Why instead, how to say, like the, uh, the, the place where the information was was a lot smaller than you thought it was. So why instead do you posit this um, account in which it's actually a structure of nature that these are present? Well, first of all, I didn't say it was a structure of nature. I, I've been very careful to say, I said it a few moments ago, I'll say it again. First, we have to actually detect supersymmetry, and then this is a property of the equations which have supersymmetry. The next issue is, is this a property of nature? Well, until I or someone else can figure out how to make a, a prediction on the presence of these, because due to the presence of these things, I cannot answer that question. It's in the, all I can say is it's in the mathematics. Until I can make a prediction, I don't know how to tell whether it's a property of nature or not. Let's thank Professor Gates. <laughs>